So, we have been deluged with information about Kofi Annan, but tonight I'd like to deal with the information that the mass media is keeping away from us on Kofi Annan, the United Nations, the Rwandan Holocaust, and the oil for food scandal, just for starters. Good journalism wants to get behind the front page headlines and get the news behind the news. Uh, so, tonight, Kofi Annan, the United Nations, the Rwandan Holocaust, and the oil for school oil for food scandal. General Secretary of the UN Kofi Annan died just under two weeks ago. The first black African to lead the United Nations, he died in Switzerland at age 80. First question, what was a gone and doing living in Switzerland? Kofi Annan's personal role as head of the United Nations peacekeeping operations from 1993 to 1997 was, to put it nicely, controversial. This period, while he was Secretary General of the UN, saw the killing of 18 American service personnel in Somalia, the so-called Black Hawk Down, in October 1993, and they were not given the weapons they needed, they were not given the protection they needed, they were not given the armored vehicles they were needed, and people died as a result of the restrictions placed on them by Kofi Annan and Bill Clinton, of course. That was Operation Gothic Serpent. And these were the casualties of that disastrous peacekeeping mission. Then there was the massacre of more than 800,000 Rwandans in the genocide of 1994 in Rwanda. We'll get back to that in a moment. And the massacre of 8,000 Bosnians under United Nations protection at Srebrenica in 1995. This was one of the biggest UN operations in Bosnia. UN peacekeepers noticed the Canadian flag on that tank there. And uh, these were United Nations peacekeepers, and they were there to protect these people, and they let 8,000 people be massacred in one of the camps they were protecting. July 1995, on Kofi Annan's watch. Corruption and fraud is the hallmark of the UN. In Rwanda and Bosnia, United Nations forces were quick to ban the peacekeeping missions. Now, this just shows you how sometimes, if you can just position uh, your picture right, uh, you can get a nice, maybe unintended message. The UN involved in peace, or uninvolved in peace. In both cases, Bosnia and Rwanda, Kofi Annan was accused of failing to safeguard those who had looked to the United Nations forces for protection. Serving two five-year terms as UN Secretary General, Anand then presided over the world body during the disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was the first from the bureaucracy to lead the UN. Normally you didn't get bureaucrats going all the way up to General Secretary, but he did. And he championed expansive UN programs, including the controversial condom programs, the handouts. Under Anand, UN peacekeepers in Sierra Leone Congo received a condom a day, with an unspokesman claiming they have the same value as flak jackets. This is, uh, and I'm afraid in Namibia we saw the UN peacekeeping forces, they were the same. In 2004, Anand faced down calls for his resignation after presiding over one of the world's largest financial fraud schemes, the UN-led Oil for Food program in Iraq, whose Billions in contracts benefited his son, Koja Anan. He betrayed the people of Iraq. This, by the way, is what liberation Iraq looks like. Aren't these people really glad that they got freed? The people of Iraq owe no debt of gratitude to Anan, they say. He consistently ignored their suffering and he opposed their liberation. He actively undermined all coalition efforts to establish security and rebuild their country. The Iraq War undermined Anand's own position as a world leader and exposed the United Nations' growing impotence in the post-9-11 era. It also exposed the huge degree of corruption and mismanagement involving the UN's Oil for Food program, an epic scandal that continues to unfold. We haven't seen the end of that yet. Monumental mismanagement. His 10 years in power as General Secretary were a monumental failure, and he left behind an institution whose standings could barely be lower, and his legacy that's a testament to mismanagement and corruption. The United Nations has been dominated by scandal, division, and failure, and yes, that is Uncle Fidel Castro, dictates, longest reigning dictator in the world at that time, 
marching with his pal Kofi Annan. From the disaster of the United Nations peacekeeping missions in Rwanda and Bosnia in the mid-1990s when he was head of the Security Council to the UN's slow response to the genocide in Sudan, its recent track record has been spectacularly unimpressive. Bring about cartoons like this, you know, what's the problem? Anand's successor inherited a UN whose image has slipped to an all-time low. The oil for food and Congo peacekeeping scandals have had a devastating impact on the United Nations reputation and it's reinforced the view that the world body is riddled with corruption and mismanagement as well as undisciplined in its peacekeeping operations. Undisciplined is a very soft term. The failure of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, now renamed the UN Human Rights Council, which has been populated with some of the world's worst human rights violators, has added to the United Nations' poor image. Under Kofi Annan, the United Nations shamelessly appeased dictators and tyrants and persecutors of the church from Baghdad to Tehran to Khartoum and has stood weak-kneed in the face of genocide and ethnic cleansing. And you've got really, it, if this was part of some kind of comedy show, it would look absolutely unrealistic. How could you have such a bunch of thugs in the Human Rights Council? But you do. This, for example, is none other than Omar al-Bashir, dictator of Sudan, wanted for genocide by the Hague Court of Justice. There is an Interpol warrant out for his arrest for genocide. But he can be welcomed to the United Nations and have this grinning Kofi Annan welcoming him and embracing him as a friend. In fact, a man is known by his friends, and you will just notice there's a trend here. Kofi Annan is the friend of dictators, mass murderers, tyrants, terrorists, and persecutors of the church. Like, just off the top of one's head, Yasser Arafat, for example. As head of the United Nations peacekeeping operations in the mid-1990s, before he rose to be Secretary General, Annan never apologized to the victims of the Rwandan genocide, whose slaughter was a direct consequence of the United Nations' failure to intervene and he'd never apologized to the families of those massacred in Srebrenica in Bosnia while under the protection of United Nations so-called soldiers. Anand's lack of humility in the face of this great human tragedy has been one of his great shortcomings as a UN leader. I call the United Nations a bunch of gangsters with flags. The UN's new Human Rights Council touted by Anand as a breakthrough for the UN is an unmitigated farce as the United Nations has largely jettisoned the principles of liberty and freedom, which South African Prime Minister at the time wrote into the Charter for the UN. You'll remember that General Jan Smuts was the author of both the preamble to the League of Nations in 1919 and the United Nations in 1945. The Council's lack of membership criteria renders it open to participation and manipulation by the world's worst human rights abusers, and let's also add human traffickers and drug dealers, terrorists and mass murderers, persecutors of the church too. Tyrannical regimes such as Burma have been persecuting mercilessly the Karen Christians, or Syria, or Libya, or Sudan, where they've been waging a genocidal war against Christians for as long as this government has been in power in Sudan. And Zimbabwe, one of the worst governments on the planet all voted in favor of establishing the council in the face of strong U.S. opposition. The brutal North Korean dictatorship also endorsed the council too. When council elections were held, leading human rights abusers, Algeria, China, Cuba, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia were elected onto the Human Rights Council. This is beyond a joke. And just to show you what a laughable joke the UN is, here's Fidel Castro addressing the UN. And this is Che Guevara, this dirty, unwashed, Marxist, mass-murdering thug who boasted of killing at least 4,000 people, including women and children, in cold blood, without due process of trial. And Yasser Arafat, the terrorist who's responsible for how many plane hijackings and murder of innocent people, and dictator of Nigeria, and, of course, Gaddafi for women's rights. And, yes, 
Exactly. People like Mugabe. That's why I call these gangsters with flags. The United Nations, I also call the largest collection of unelected mass murderers and human traffickers on the planet. In one place, you have got the vast majority of the UN leaders have no electoral mandate from the population. They've got no shred of legitimacy in terms of any legality. They're human rights abusers. They are involved, many of them, in slavery, in human trafficking, in sex trafficking, in mass murder. They're involved in every kind of persecution of the church. This is a bunch of cocaine-sniffing, drug-dealing, human trafficking, mass murderers. So why do we even respect the UN? The hostility of the United Nations to everything Christian is obvious by their consistent support for nations that persecute the church and their failure to effectively address the targeting of Christian minorities. The disgraceful track record of the United Nations when they've intervened militarily in nations reveals their true nature. The United Nations mission to the Congo, the invasion of Katanga, and the forcing of that stable pro-Western state to rejoin the communist chaos of the Congo, and the atrocities perpetrated against Christian civilians by the United Nations Force in the Congress are well documented in The Fearful Master. And G. Edward Griffin, who wrote this book, uses the title taken from a quote by first American President General George Washington. George Washington said, government is not reason, government is force. And like a fire, government makes a dangerous servant and a fearful master. If you've got a fire in your house, Better make sure it's in the fireplace. You don't want to get out of the fireplace. If it gets out of the fireplace, if it touches your curtains, which are normally highly flammable, or your carpets or your upholstery, the whole house is doomed. And so it is. You've got to keep government chained down by the chains of the Constitution to keep it in its limited area. Because if it gets out of that bound of defense and law and order, if it goes into other things, like the economy or running schools or hospitals, then the entire country is doomed. Katanga was a Christian, pro-Western, stable state that was invaded, bombed by the United Nations against their own charter, bombing, strafing people in the streets in Elizabethville and in Stanleyville, what today would be Lubumbashi and, uh, and, Kat Lubumbashi and Kisangani. Yes, Stanleyville is now Kisangani. Here you can see Red Cross on the roof of a hospital, church, shops, bombed by the United Nations, shooting up people, including this poor person in his beetle, killed his wife and children, the only survivor of his family uh, in the end, shot by Pakistani UN troops was his dog and himself, lost his family at a UN roadblock. What could be military about a VW beetle? This is what they called Operation Grand Slam, when Congo had been split into three, actually four places, if you add South Kasai. Katanga was stable. Uh, this was one big terrorist-run Simba operation. Stanleyville, they were actually, what today is Lubumbash, uh, is Kisangani. They were sacrificing missionaries by the hundreds in front of a big picture, a uh, massive-sized picture of Patricia Lumumba, the first president of the country, and you know, doing human sacrifice in front of them. And that's when the uh, paratroopers of the Belgians were sent to try and rescue them, but everyone recognized they wouldn't get there in time. And so the missionaries uh, of mission societies asked my, mad Mike Hall and his wild geese, who were Rhodesian and South African mercenaries, to get there first and save these missionaries before they were all slaughtered. And they got there before the Belgian paratroopers and they rescued hundreds uh, who were all lined up uh, and there was piles of bodies of those who had already been sacrificed and uh, later the paratroopers came and took the credit but uh, they weren't there to save anyone and this is and the UN nothing <laughs> they created the chaos they did nothing to save the lives of people being slaughtered up in this area of what was then Stanleyville but they could invade Katanga where everything was peaceful and stable to force them to rejoin the communist chaos a series of UN peacekeeping scandals from Bosnia to Burundi to Sierra Leone and Haiti have occurred under Kofi Annan's watch. The largest concentration of abuse took place in the Congo, the UN's second largest peacekeeping mission with 16,000 so-called peacekeepers in the Congo right now. 
In the Congo, acts of barbarism have been perpetrated by United Nations peacekeepers and civilian personnel who have been entrusted with protecting some of the weakest, most vulnerable women and children in the world. Personnel from the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which, because of French uh, um, um, abbreviations, turns to monarch, stand accused of at least 150 major human rights violations and the scale of the problem is likely to be far greater. The crimes involve rape and forced prostitution of women and young girls across the country, including in a refugee camp in the town of Gunai in northeastern Congo. These are documented and are done by the UN Blue Helmet Brigade. The alleged perpetrators include UN military and civilian personnel from Nepal, Morocco, Tunisia. Notice those are all Muslim countries. Well, Nepal's Buddhist. Um, Morocco and Tunisia are Muslim. Uruguay, South Africa. We know the inclination of the people from this government, Pakistan, which is Muslim, and France, which could have a lot of Muslims in it by now. The sexual abuse scandal of Congo makes a mockery of the United Nations' professed commitment to uphold basic human rights. The exploitation of some of the most vulnerable people in the world, refugees in a war-ravaged country, was a shameful episode and a massive betrayal of trust, as well as an appalling failure of leadership. And so, these are just some UN operations all over the place. You've got millions upon billions spent in order to keep the world safe and peaceful and all of that sort of thing. And countries with good intentions or not uh, send people in great numbers. Here's 10,000 UN peacekeepers just in Central African Republic. And of course, they're in South Sudan as well. And they're causing havoc all over the place. I don't know what these British troops think, but I'd be ashamed to wear that blue beret. On my first mission to Sudan, I had my flight that had been chartered cancelled, flight clearance cancelled by the UN. So I went along to the UN headquarters then in um, Lokachokia, which is the northernmost point in Kenya. And uh, I asked around and I discovered, oh, this is great. The man who's in charge of the security side, uh, the military um, leader of the UN forces there is British ex-SAS. So British Special Air Service, and he used to be in Sea Squadron, meant he was in the Rhodesian Special Air Service. Well, I know a lot of people from Rhodesia and from Sea Squadron, so I went along and very quickly got on well with him. Instant rapport, Rhodesia, Sea Squadron, Shilly, Schillenberg, yep, knew a lot of the same people I knew and so on. And so... I said, your people have cancelled my flight clearance. No problem, he says. He pulls out his clipboard, whips out his pen. What's your cargo? And I said, Bibles. And his face changed. He put the pen away, put the clipboard to one side, stared at me and said, Bibles? There's 14 helicopter gunships stationed in Juba. I said, I know it. That's why I need your flight clearance. He shook his head and he said, you take off with Bibles. We'll blow you out of the sky. I'd say, whoa, lighten up. We're talking about Bibles. Are you threatening my life for taking Bibles into Sudan? He said, it's against the law in Sudan. So is alcohol. And you flying in whiskey and beer into your bases inside Sudan, that's also against the law in Sudan. He says, that's different. I said, I know it's different. Um, these Bibles are actually going to do something good. And... Uh, the, the man was just hostile, hostile. The moment he heard Bibles. And I had to say to him, does the blue beret suck your brains out? He's threatening my life for taking Bibles in. And this man was so serious. Do you think that these people who at one time might have been decent human beings could be turned into that kind of character? I had a Sydney's pastor say to me, Reverend Kenneth Beringer, he said, it's not that the United Nations is against religion. They're not against religion. They're just against Christianity. And it's true. I heard from the Red Cross and many others, UN ordering Mo, uh, Sudanese, Nubans even, who had been injured in bombings and they were being carried out by Red Cross and they were to be flown out in a UN aircraft. But that a cross around there, you must take the cross off, we won't let you onto the UN aircraft. I said, what happened? The people said to me, they won't take off their cross and the Muslims are threatening to kill them for it. Do you think they're going to take it off to get on a UN flight? Of course not. They were left on the airstrip. 
I've heard that from the head of the Red Cross and others in Locker Truck here. So that Blue Beret does suck their brains out. Or Blue Helmet, as the case may be. Chinese peacekeepers, no less. This is a big operation. 193 member states contribute a lot of money. $7.83 billion a year. They've got 118,000 total field personnel drawn from 122 countries. They've got 56 aircraft, 12 naval ships, 144 helicopters, 34,000 vehicles, which includes armored vehicles, of course, uh, 30 hospitals, 284 medical clinics. They're operating on 17 missions in four con continents, and Dafur is one of their operations with 22,000 people, and uh, they're saying they're covering 6 million square miles, and they've got 174 million people, local population, in the areas that they're caring for. This is a force for <coughs> peace. Change, yes, well, we know change isn't necessarily positive for the future. Well, it's not necessarily a good future. But this is what we know is going on in the Congo. You can be sure it's going on all over the place, too. The scandal surrounding the United Nations administered oil for food program had immense damage to the world organization's already shaky credibility. Iraqi crude oil came in on the oil for food program one side and Greece for palms program went out the other side. The Danish whistleblower who revealed the UN's oil for food scandal, I hope he's got good protection or had a face change or something. Basically, the oil surcharges, they gave surcharge, which was actually illegal, and then they had after sales service fees going over a, mil a billion, and then inland transportation fees, they had a whole lot of kickbacks, uh, which uh, brought an illicit $1.8 billion that they were able to uh, skim off the top, which was not meant to be done. The oil for food scandal is undoubtedly the biggest financial scandal in the history of the United Nations and probably the largest fraud of modern times, if you're not counting the banks and inflation and tax. It shattered the liberal illusion that the UN is an arbiter of moral authority in the international sphere. And so you see cartoons like this, oil for food investigation, the Iraq war has not made the world safer, no, but made him richer. And... Uh, you notice Kofi Annan's briefcase has got um, Sorry Pop uh, from Kojo uh, Annan, who is his son, who was actually running the operation. Established in the mid-1990s as a means of providing humanitarian aid for the Iraqi people, the Oil for Food program was subverted and manipulated by United Nations officials who siphoned off billions of dollars from the program through oil smuggling, through systematic thievery, by demanding illegal payments from companies buying Iraqi oil and through kickbacks from those selling goods to Iraq. And Paul Volcker, the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve, not necessarily an unbiased observer, I would have thought, was the head of the inquiry into the mother of all corruption honeypots, the UN Iraq Oil for Food program. Basically, of the 100 billion plus worth of transactions, 1.8 billion diverted as illicit payments, that we can tell more than 2,200 companies worldwide were involved. Illicit kickbacks came from companies and individuals from 66 countries for you to take part in this program, pat my palm, send this to my bank account, uh, make contributions to my entertainment allowance or whatever it is. And surcharges were paid by companies from about 40 different countries around the world. These are just some of the ones involved. And to show the the corrupt interconnections. It's boggling the brain how many of these people are working for a company and for the government and for the UN. And it's, it's like a cycle of who helps who. And <laughs> Pierre Trudeau, is, uh, who was at that time the Prime Minister in, in uh, Canada, uh, the f father uh, ostensibly of the present, um, Justin Trudeau, probably one of the worst leaders in the world today, and you notice Brian Mulroney and a whole bunch of others. They're all involved in this. And of course, Kofi Annan, he's got multiple connections involved in all of this too. So basically, it was a whole lot of kickbacks. France's total was fined for corruption in UN's Iraq oil for food program. And there were a whole bunch of different countries that got special vouchers uh, as 
far as this uh, illicit clandestine program went. And then we talk about nepotism. Despite widespread criticism, Kofi Annan never took responsibility for a scandal that irreparably damaged the United Nations reputation. Not that I thought it ever deserved to have a reputation to start with. But a huge cloud remains over the UN Secretary General with regard to the oil for food contractor Kotekna, which employed his son Kojo from 1995, continued to pay him through 2004, although he didn't seem to have to come into office much for getting a lot of payment. He was on staff in order to, for them to get the contract, that sort of thing. Funds for favours, or pay for play, as they might call it. Questions also remain regarding Anand's appointment of Achim Steiner as Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme, UNIP. Just months after Steiner helped award Anand $500,000, Steiner, whose four-year term of office began in June 2006, was part of a nine-member jury chaired by a senior UN official who gave a cash gift to Anand the previous December. Obviously no connection, sheer coincidence. But Anand's initial decision was to accept such a huge prize. He eventually was forced to give it to charity because of the publicity that came out of it. But as well as a subsequent appointment of a man who played a key role in awarding him half a million dollars, gave the appearance of major abuse of power. An appearance of a major abuse of power. I'm not saying it was abuse of power, just seems like it. Both were extraordinary acts of political recklessness by the Secretary General that gives the impression that jobs at the UN can be traded for financial favours. Of course, that's how it works. It's all a, you scratch my back, I pay into your account. As an international public servant, the Secretary General should not have accepted money from a UN member state or a private foundation, either as an award or as a gift. doesn't matter how you phrase it. It's like our arms scandal here in this country as well. You know, they happen to get uh, BMWs and things like this as gifts uh, along with signing this contract. Well, um, called a gift or called a bribe, it comes to the same thing. He should also have completely disclosed his personal finances as many Western politicians are required to do. And he should also have abided by the same strict ethics and disclosure rules that apply to major political figures in democracies like the United States and Great Britain. And none has talked about accountability and transparency and the supposed winds of change sweeping through the UN, but his own leadership betrays the emptiness of his words. They are empty. They mean nothing. A secretive culture of impunity still dominates the upper echelons of the UN Secretary. They are all as corrupt as hell. Now, how does it work? You've got the General Assembly, 193 members, one country, one vote. They recommend things. They don't have the power. The powers actually appear in the Security Council. There's five permanent members, Red China, Russia, France, America and Britain. They're the five permanent members. They're ten non-permanent members who don't really have a say. They think they do, but any of those five permanent members, any one of them can veto everything. They appoint the Secretary General. He implements what they want, basically. So he's basically a tool for the five superpowers, as they call them. They decide and they control the peacekeeping forces, which is actually under Secretary General. Now, all these organs around here, they're meant to be under the General Assembly, but actually they're only under the Security Council, in effect, under the Secretary General. That's just the way it works. So, UN humanitarian aid, most of it gets funneled off to help the dictators, and a drop might sometimes reach some of the victims. Maybe, but not likely. And then you get these creeps around here, like the one in the middle there is the senior Rothschild bankster right now, and Murdoch over here is one who runs Fox News, which is meant to be the conservative mouthpiece in America, but these guys have massive oil benefits, which all benefit from wars and so on. So, unaccountable, also unregenerate and ungodly and un all sorts of other things too. Um, and you can see here, Kofi A. Annan, uh, New World Order, same old corruption, because terrorist lackeys need retirement plans too, and entertainment lounges. Now, it's not just Kofi Annan. Here's a former UN president, John Ish, arrested for bribery. He was getting huge amounts of bribery from Red China and so on, and also from Antigua, and he is getting everything from cars, Rolex watches. Um, 
basketball court, courts built in his home and what have you, uh, in return for favours, putting different things in place. You can imagine, you can, as any hire leader, you can give contracts and they'll give you kickbacks if you award them contracts. And then there's the Secretary General, Sen Jen is my name and corruption is my game. This is Ban Ki-moon, he's the present Secretary General. He's as corrupt as hell as well. I mean, that's another day, but he hasn't died, so we're not talking about him at the moment. So in an interview with the London Daily Telegraph, US Ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton, described the United Nations as hopelessly out of touch, stuck in a Twilight Zone-style time warp where there are practices and attitudes that approach us that were abandoned 30 years ago in much of the rest of the world. What's he talking about? Communism. There's still a bunch of communists in the UN, where most people have abandoned it 30 odd years ago. In a March 2006 poll conducted by Gallup in the United States, just 28% had a positive image of the UN's job performance, the most negative rating for the UN in its history. I don't know what the 28% were thinking. <laughs> I, I think they must be um, brain dead to have thought the UN's got a good job performance. Today's United Nations, quoting from this UN uh, ambassador, um, that's John Bolton. Today's United Nations is a broken institution, he says, in fundamental need of wholesale reform. That is a nun's legacy, and the United States and the world looks forward to a new leadership as Turtle Bay, leadership that is untarnished by scandal and actually lives up to the ideals of the UN's own Declaration of Human Rights, which was written by <coughs> General Chris, Jan Christian de Wett, who, I uh, should say, written by Jan Christian Smuts, who was a tool of the New World Order anyway, and of the bankers. But at least the Declaration of Human Rights sounds nice now and then, not that they ever take it seriously. The UN needs a Secretary General who will seek real reform of the UN bureaucracy and aggressively stand up for democracy, human rights and freedom. Now that's a quote from Niall Gardner, uh, who's of the uh, Margaret Thatcher Centre for Freedom, a uh, part of the Heritage Foundation. The three pillars of the New World Order and the global elite are a one-world economy, a one-world government, and a one-world religion. And their shorthand to describe all this is globalism. The United Nations is the most visible attempt to create a one-world government. The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has also supported homosexual marriage, so-called. In LifeSite News 2003, they report that the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan came out in favor of homosexual marriage. He attended part of a homosexual activist conference held at the United Nations. And this conference demanded that international treaties such as the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights include rights for homosexual couples, like they don't have the same rights that everyone else has to property and life and all that. The United Nations release said the Secretary General was glad to be able to attend part of the event he believes that the United Nations cannot condone any persecution or discrimination against people on any grounds, well, except for Christianity, of course, and recalls Article 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind. On the issue of same-sex marriage, his personal view is that individuals should be allowed to make their own choices and that we should be careful not to draw conclusions or adopt prejudicial attitudes towards people for their choices and preferences. Well, unless they're Christians, of course. The United Nations, through various <laughs> committees, has been the forefront of advocating international acceptance of homosexuality and bestowing the rights normally reserved for the family on homosexual unions, so-called. He's also described abortion as essential. <laughs> Kofi Annan has emphasized that sexual and reproductive health which is a code word for abortion, is an essential part of human rights. That is, he supports abortion and other population control measures, including explicit sex education to the extent they should be declared human rights. For example, this is a UN, there we go, World Health Organization, WHO, and they are showing abortions around the world. Notice most abortions are in Asia. Now, the red means least safe least safe abortions. Well, of course, they're all unsafe for the babies. Um, so the, the white are legal safe abortions. And, for example, they're showing that in Africa, most of Africa doesn't have safe and legal abortions. I presume this corner is what's legal in ANC South Africa. 
if the rest of Africa doesn't have abortion legal. So this is their concern. Their concern is not the babies. Uh, their concern is, in fact, being able to eradicate the babies. The United Nations is pro-abortion, aggressively pro-abortion. Ultimately, though, this emphasis on a new category of human rights has as its real purpose to advance the agenda of what Kofi Annan says, the need to stabilize the population of the planet. Well, stabilize the wrong word. They want to bring it from 7 billion down to 1 billion. In fact, they've even said in some reports, you should bring the world's population down to 100 million. Of course, they'd be parts of that group. But you'd think, what happens to the other 6 to 7 million, a billion people? Well, yeah, got to get rid of them one way or the other. A nun and most other depopulationists, that's the term they use for bring the world's population down dramatically, see legitimization and protection of homosexuality as one more way to keep procreation down and to undermine marriage and other institutions, especially religious institutions, that emphasize that children are a blessing. Because children aren't a blessing, children are a burden, according to Kofi Annan and the UN. Now all this I get from LifeSite News. Uh, here's some of their reports on uh, pushing abortion and, and lesbianism at the UN and so on. And so the UN all over the world are going out and you know what happened in Namibia. Namibia had the lowest AIDS rate in the world before the UN force came in and after they left they had the highest AIDS rate in all of the world. And so that's the UN's ability to be able to spread AIDS more efficiently. Kofi Annan's personal role as the head of the United Nations peacekeeping operations from 1993 to 1997 was controversial to say the least. His legacy includes the massacre of over 800,000 Rwandans and a genocide in 1994. The United Nations' complicity in disarming the general population Rwanda enabled the Rwandan Holocaust of April, May 1994. Notice this bizarre, ridiculous piece of modern art outside the front of the UN. Notice they don't have an AK-47 or an RPG, or a landmine, or a limpet mine being twisted. They have a revolver. This isn't a terrorist weapon. This is a civilian or police defensive weapon. And so it's quite clear they're not talking about disarming the terrorists, or they would have used an AK-47 or something. They're talking about disarming the general population. And we've got some replica miniature of this at the waterfront for some strange reason. The United Nations forces stood by and failed to save lives entrusted to the care. They helped disarm the people first and then they stood by while they were massacred. The UN actually handed over thousands of Christian refugees who had fled to them for protection into the hands of the inter-Hambwe mass murderers who slaughtered them. At this gate, I took this picture when I visited Rwanda, and in that stadium were something like 15,000 refugees, Tutsis who had fled to them for protection. And every day, the inter-Hambwe came to the gate with a list of teachers, journalists, pastors, yeah, troublemakers. And the UN went to trouble going through the stadium, finding these people, bring them out, and they were hacked to death within sight of the UN guards, within sight of the gate. Next day they came with another list. And the UN went and found them too and brought them out. And they did this day after day, week after week. And then, finally, Kofi Annan said, evacuate, and the UN evacuated and left everyone there to get slaughtered. The Christians were slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands around Rwanda. The UN, which had disarmed them, stood by and did nothing while they were killed. More people were killed in Rwanda with machetes in two months than have died from atomic weapons in all of history. I walked knee-deep through this church through, through corpses. About 1,200 dead people in Natarama Church, in and around it. Skulls on the lectern, a pulpit. Skulls piled up outside. And you can just see the destruction. And here, this parliament, you can see that it's bullets, not ballots, that changed the government in Rwanda. The UN did nothing to save the lives of the people. It was these Rwandese Patriotic Front rebels, resistance fighters from neighboring Uganda, who came in with the help of Museveni of Uganda. They got some weapons, and they came over in desperation, David versus Goliath, what could they do to, to stop this, the massacres? They were a small minority, and they were just refugees across the board. What, they didn't even have any military experience. But, you know, bullies are cowards. And everywhere the Rwandese Patriotic Front attacked, the Rwandese Hutu mass-murdering thugs and government fled. And in came the French, 
At last, the French who had done nothing to respond to General Romeo Dallier's pleas for help, they came in to create a corridor of safety for the mass murdering into Hamburg mass murderers. This is what's called Operation Tukoise. See, Operation Tukoise, safe haven. The French paratroopers created a cordon of safety where the inter Hamburg mass murderers could flee to so they could bring them in under Lake Kivu into what was then called Zaire, what is now the Congo, because Mobutu Sese Seko was supportive of them and they found sanctuary there. And so hundreds of thousands, actually it might have been millions in the end, of refugees, and these would be the inter Hamburg mass murderers or their family members fleeing justice under the protection of the French government who were accessories before, during, and after the fact to the genocide in Rwanda. They had trained them, they had armed them. They had resupplied them during the genocide, as documented by UN Peacekeeping Force Commanding Officer General Romeo Delier. And here are the French bringing in these mass murderers into the Congo, where they could be safe from justice. And then in came, with them, vast amounts of aid from the UN to help the mass murderers, the inter Hamburg, and they got the aid. Not the victims of the massacres in Rwanda, the people who had done the genocide. They got most of the aid. Now, the most popularly known film in this is not worth much. Hotel Rwanda was filmed in South Africa, not in Rwanda. There wasn't one Rwandese in the film. It was all a bunch of Americans and South Africans acting as Rwandese in South Africa, which just, I mean, you can see the streets. <laughs> this is not Rwanda. Uh, you, you can see that immediately. Uh, but uh, uh, the film does focus on a true story of a hotel manager who did save 1,200 lives of Tutsi people targeted through bluff, intrigue, and courage. And it's a good story, and it's a brave story, and well done. But they did not show the Christian faith of the Tutsi being targeted, except for this one picture, you saw some Catholic nuns with a cross, but there's no prayer, there's no hymn singing, nothing. And the UN is portrayed as really trying to help them. In fact, they didn't draw out the pistols or shoot uh, during the, um, the attacks there, although in the film they do at least fire in the air or something. And this film doesn't explain that Christians being targeted and there's no hymn singing, no prayer, nothing. However, yes, this is the stadium where they had 15,000 people betrayed to the mass murderers. Now, General Romeo Delier, in his book, Shake Hands of the Devil, documents how he knew that Red China had sent in a million machetes, pangas, and they were all in one warehouse. They hadn't been destroyed yet, and you knew that they were being destroyed, and you knew why they were being destroyed. He was well informed. And he was forbidden by UN Secretary General, sorry, UN Security Council uh, Chief, which was Kofi Annan, from seizing those machetes in order to stand down and cease and desist. They knew what was coming. He said from January of 1994 they knew. He had informed Kofi Annan, he had informed the Secretary General, Butchus Butchus Ghali, Warren Christopher of the US government knew, and so too did Bill Clinton. January, four months before the massacres began. The British made a more honest film called Shooting Dogs, which was renamed in America Beyond the Gates. It was actually filmed at the ETO school, which I've been to, and it's seen through the eyes of a British church worker, volunteer, short-term worker, and what he experienced and how he saw the missionary that he was there to help, a British Catholic missionary. Uh, and yes, I mean, that's the kind of sticks they were walking around with. And at this mission base, the UN protected them, 2,500. But at the end, Kofi Annan ordered the UN to withdraw and not take any of the local people with. And this missionary refused to leave with them. He said, if you're going to condemn these people to death, then I'll choose to die with my congregation. He stayed behind, and he was hacked to death along with his congregation. That's beyond the gates. That's one story, and that was all filmed in Rwanda with the Rwandese playing Rwandese. Another staggering indictment on the UN comes from an insider. This is Gen General Romeo Delier. 
He was the Lieutenant General, Canadian Forces, in charge of UN peacekeeping forces in Rwanda under direct control of Cameroonian Foreign Minister uh, Bubu, believe it or not, both of whom were under <coughs> Kofi Annan as head of the Security Council. And notice this subtitle, The Failure of Humanity. Humanity. Not the failure of the United Nations, which would have been more honest. That's was what he first wanted the title to be, the failure of the United Nations. But he is persuaded to tone it down to failure of humanity. He went in, as he describes, in euphoria. He, they were coming to save these people, to protect these people. He really was a believer in the UN. He believed the UN was there to actually help. And he was shattered. His life was destroyed. In fact, as he says... He cannot get up and operate each day without nine tablets every day to, you know, uppers, downers, and everything else. He needs to be kept awake and to be able to sleep. Uh, and he says he's not able to function. He says, you don't want to see me without um, my medication because his post-traumatic stress syndrome destroyed. The film was filmed in Rwanda, with Rwandese, playing Rwandese, in the actual places where it took place, made the hair on the back of my head stand up, and he was on site, General Romeo Delier, to guide to see that the film was an accurate portrayal, and I think it was. And it's one damning indictment on the UN, because he makes it clear, we knew, we could have stopped it. It could have been stopped, we could have, it didn't have to happen. The UN totally failed. And when he's asked who he blames, he says, well, he blames Bill Clinton, he blames Warren Christopher, he blames the United Nations, he blames uh, Secretary General, he blames, yeah, they all failed. He even says, we failed. He says, I failed. Um, I went there and I was meant to save the people. And one of his biggest regrets is that he didn't dis obey orders and spend the rest of his life in prison for disobeying orders but at least have a clear conscience because these people who had come to UN for protection were betrayed. This is Natarama Church. I've been right here, outside here. Well, it wasn't as ordered as this when I went there. Uh, they've, they've literally categorized. And uh, this is now in the Genocide <coughs> Museum in Kigali where they're trying to get some of the pictures, some of the victims, to try and give a face to the victims that were wiped out by this Hutu genocide. And here in this church, at the 20th anniversary of the genocide, many of these are children born since, who can't even begin to understand what their parents went through. Just to remind you, mass shootings, the governments are undisputed heavyweight champions of mass shootings. But in Rwanda, it was mostly machetes, low-tech genocide. A lot of documentation on it. I wrote Holocaust in Rwanda, one of the early books on this the roles of gun control, media manipulation, liberal church leaders, and the United Nations. This has been translated into French as well. Today, some of the genocidal architects are living under the protection of the government of France and Canada. Despite France and Canada being signatories to the anti-genocide treaty. Now, the president of um, Rwanda, Kagame, he was head of Rwanda's Patriotic Front, so he's one of those who fought to stop the genocide. He kicked out the UN, and he abolished French as a national language, made English the national language, because the French government, when asked, and the French foreign minister was asked, how can you be protecting the genocide architects in France? And he said, we were holding the line for Francophone Africa against Anglophone Africa. In other words, the Hutu mass murderer spoke French and some of the Tutsi spoke English. Why did some of the Tutsi speak English? Because they'd fled to Uganda for protection of, uh, from previous massacres. And so many of them spoke English. And so now they've made English the official language of the whole country because they've basically said to hell with France. This man's also said to hell with the UN, you're not welcome here, out and never welcome back again. And this is the same leader who said, we don't want any aid, we just want fair trade. They are selling multiplied millions of tulips to Amsterdam every year because uh, Amsterdam can't keep up with the amount of tulips and their coffee and other things. This is a country where it's the easiest country in the world to open up a business. Just one page, no licenses. 
our team to traveled across 12 countries in Africa back in 2013 for the Livingston 200 said Rwanda's the uh, nicest, cleanest, safest place they came across. And that included South Africa. When they finally got Kofi Annan, 10 years after the genocide, to, to make some kind of confession or apology to the people of Rwanda, this is the best he could come up with. The world failed you. Not I failed you. Not the Security Council failed you. Not the United Nations failed you. The whole world failed you. This is classic, secular, humanist, atheist. Nothing's my fault. I'm a victim. Everything's somebody else's fault. Typical. To, this is a classic secular humanist mentality here. Which is why we have a sign, this is a UN free zone. In fact, when they have UN flag day, we've sometimes burned a UN flag, and one time we've made the UN flag a doormat for UN flag day, but um, we will never fly the UN flag. Then you think of the massacre of 8,000 Bosnians under UN protection in a UN refugee camp. The UN is a criminal enterprise. The United Nations' involvement in human trafficking has been well documented and is dramatized in the book and the film The Whistleblower, based on American policewoman Catherine Bolkovac's experiences in Bosnia. Now, she was a policewoman who came to Bosnia thinking her job was to help people, protect people. I mean, what else are policewomen meant to do? And she discovered the sex trade there, rescued women who'd been human trafficked from what uh, used to be Romania, but now is part of, it's Moldova, Moldova, which is one of the highest human traffic places in the world. She revealed the UN's links with the sex trade and was fired by the UN. She went as high as the Secretary General, who at that stage was none other than Kofi Annan. He was by then, he'd become Secretary General, and he fired her for revealing what, what they were doing. She rescued two girls from uh, the sex traffickers, put them into high security witness protection program who immediately handed them back to the mass murdering thugs, pimps who tortured these girls to death. She went to the head of the mission. She went as high as the Secretary General of the UN, which is Kofi Annan, and the response was she is fired. There's a price put on her head. She had to flee. She fled to Britain. And in Britain... Uh, she went through application for political asylum, and a British High Court said her story is true and she needs protection and she can't return to home country of America because her life would be at risk. She's under witness protection program in Great Britain because she can't return to home country of America because the UN will take her out. That's what a British High Court determined. The whistleblower. Could it happen again? Of course, all the time. Look at this map. The green is where human trafficking is legal and practiced. And the fact is, most of the governments in the UN are involved in human trafficking. So when you get the UN together, 193 countries, what are you getting? The majority of them are into human trafficking and slavery and persecution church and so on. So why would you think they'd be serious about dealing with a crime that's pervasive amongst their members? Most of these flags represent illegitimate governments, unelected governments, who persecute the church, who arrest their own people, who would kill their own citizens if that citizen posed a threat to them. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. You don't recognize where that quote comes from? First Star Wars, Star Wars number four. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Well, I would venture to guess... This is even more wretched than what they talk about in the first Star Wars. Giving evil a voice since 1945. Kofi Nunn has championed homosexual marriages. He's been involved in one of the biggest financial fraud schemes ever, oil for food program, billions of which benefits his son. All of this makes it extraordinary that some Christians, even prominent Christians, have saluted and hailed Kofi Nunn as a great African diplomat and leader. Now, I can understand why Fidel Castro and other communists would hail Kofi Annan. I mean, he's been a good friend to the commies, and I think every communist and terrorist would want to salute and hail him. But why would a Christian leader want to hail an anti-Christian, pagan, 
top leader of the New World Order as a great African diplomat and leader. 2 Peter 2 verse 19 says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. As Kofi Annan has died, we should remind everyone that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this comes the judgment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he's done, whether good or bad. God's law is a stand. We will not be judged in the day of judgment by the UN Declaration of Human Rights or the UN Constitution or our country's constitution. We're going to be judged according to God's law. That's the only law that counts in God's court. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works, by the things that were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. In John 5, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. We need to remind people of these facts. Some people may escape justice on earth, but no one will escape justice on the Day of Judgment. Agenda 2, Master of Deceit, documents a lot of what I'm talking about behind the scenes of how Marxism controls the United Nations. I never pledge allegiance to the UN flag and it'll be a cold day in hell before I do. It'll be ice skating in hell first. So we take the UN flags to the shooting range and we show our allegiance to the UN flag. Remember, in 67 countries of the world, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. And those governments persecuting those Christians are representatives of the United Nations, honored, called honorable, welcome to the podium in the front to speak, while churches are being burned and bombed like this, and Christians are being beheaded and tortured and enslaved. We cannot be at peace with the UN while a good one-third of the UN is at war with the church. So that's why our newsletters are trying to expose this. We need to distribute them widely. Our websites are putting on the articles, this presentation, audio, and uh, written, and in terms of uh, the video will be placed on the website. I've got notes on this as well. Um, Coffee and and his legacy. I would encourage those of you who are in touch with Christians who have put out positive eulogies for Coffee and to give your personal opinion back to them and to let them know what you think of that. And we need to remind people of the standards that we should be running our country and our continent by. Biblical principles, God's law. That's the perfect law of liberty. Not the UN. UN's Declaration of Human Rights is nothing. That, that is just a cover for persecutors of the church and human traffickers. We need to call people back to God's word and God's law, to real history. And so that's so important. On the Henry Morton Stanley School of Christian Journalism website, you'll see the articles that we've been given through this year on the series and the videos and links to the audios because it's vital that we win this war in the battle for the media. There's five culture-carrying institutions for discipleship, and that's education, entertainment, news media, religious institutions, political. We're emphasizing this here, particularly the news media. This is a battle for the mind. We've got to understand what's going on now, and we've also got to understand recent history. So, any questions? Any comments? Yes. In 1976, 77, I was in my second, third year of textile school finishing off in, in Austria. There, our uh, geography and history professor, Dr. So and so, he was talking about Dr. Kurt Waldheim is going to be the first UN general secretary. 
then you will be stood up and said, well, that also that was kicked out of Austrian politics because it was useless, he's becoming now head of the UN. For what? The UN, there is no United Nations. No, there will never be a United Nations. Nations are on their own, not united. The same thing with European Union. There will not be a European Union. There will be just opening of the borders for all the criminals to crisscross as they want. That was in those days as youngsters. We said that. I was at school a very young boy when Kurt Waltham was General Secretary. I remember he was one of the swear words at our school too. I mean, Kurt Waltham, what a backstabbing lowlife. We had no time for those guys. <coughs> My question would be, uh, when you're a like, citizen of a country like Congo and then they are still there, they are allowed by the government, what mm -hmm. can we do to, to let them go? The only thing you can do is information. It's an information battle. We've got to teach, we've got to preach, we've got to disseminate literature. But fortunately now, because of social media, we've got videos, audios, PowerPoints, slides, news items, links. We can post information. If people can understand what the UN does and what the UN stands for and what they don't stand against, they're doing nothing to stand up for the right to life of pre-born babies. They're doing nothing to protect Christians from persecution in the Muslim Middle East. They have done nothing to help the Christians in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, and you could carry on with many examples. But who are they helping? Enemies of the church. So if Christians understood, they'd start saying, wait a minute, the UN is not our friend. And in fact, when they come to a place, I don't know about all the other parts of Africa, but where I've been, I know that they were bad influence in Sudan. They were extremely bad in Rwanda. Uh, they weren't good in Namibia. Uh, and uh, so, uh, oh, and I could then add Angola <laughs> as well. Angola, they were very, very, very bad, uh, extremely bad. Uh, so uh, in my limited experience, and then I've got friends in Yugoslavia who tell me how terrible they were in Bosnia, Serbia, and so on. So. Uh, if people know what the UN's record is, and the people of Congo have probably suffered more than anyone else, what they did in the 60s to Katanga and what they're doing there now, um, I think the people of the Congo, if the people are to understand what the UN's been doing, they would not want them there. So it's got to be an information war first. So do you think the president knows anything about it? I don't know, but I do know he'd probably get benefits because when they come... There's all kinds of freebies. That if the government says, well, you must, uh, you know, we've got some expenses. If you're coming in, you've got to pay these visas. Or they'll get benefits. I mean, the UN's got billions to throw around, and they'll throw a few million here and there. And so the leaders probably think, oh, this is good. This is, it's increasing our coffers. We're getting more, whatever. I'm not sure how they pay, but I can only imagine these governments welcome them because they're getting something for it. So many governments might be doing it for the wrong motives. They might be doing it because they're ill-informed. So at any rate, the solution is still information, I would say. Yes. The five permanent members of the Security Council, where, why is Germany not there? What is its role in the UN? Oh, what's, what's well, do you not remember how the UN came about? The United Nations first started by a KGB agent, Olga Hiss, who's later proven convicted for being a KGB agent, who was appointed by great communist friend FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, set up the UN under him. He's the first general secretary, Alga Hiss, was convicted KGB terrorist and spy. And they were held in San Francisco, gay capital of the world. And so the first UN uh, General Assembly was there, and it was the Allies. And the United Nations, which made the Soviet Union so on uh, permanent members, was organized precisely to destroy the anti-communist countries of Germany and Japan. And they were the two main blocks on the expansion of communism. Japan was stopping communism taking over China. Germany was stopping communism taking over Europe. And once they were removed, communism expanded dramatically to take the whole of Eastern and Central Europe and uh, the whole of Red China and North Korea, of course. And so the United Nations started out to enable the Soviet Union to survive Operation Barbarossa, to destroy Germany and Japan and, def and to keep them in permanent uh, suppression. Therefore, the United Nations, from its inception, was designed to suppress Germany and Japan and to save and extend the Soviet Union's influences. And the first uh, man in the International Monetary Fund was also a KGB agent. In fact, 
it was riddled with commies. FDR didn't seem to be able to appoint anybody to any important position who wasn't a communist. The man who founded the OSS, uh, the um, Office of Secret Service, which was the forerunner for CA, also a communist. So when people try to say, well, you know, FDR wasn't a communist. Okay, he's married to a communist. I mean, his wife was definitely a communist. She was a card-carrying communist. Uh, but, but FDR wasn't a communist. Well, he couldn't have been President of America if he had been openly communist. But all of his decisions and actions helped communism. So the UN has been a, a communist stooge from the very beginning. And I think you've seen some uh, uh, pictures where you see the emblem of the Soviet Union, then you see the emblem of the UN. Only thing that's different is one's blue and the other's red. Got the same kind of globe and leaves around it. But now, now that Germany has regained its power and its strength, <coughs> I mean, it well, they it should it. they should make Germany a permanent power because Germany is one of the greatest economies in the world, and uh, of course, they're not going to let Germany be a permanent power. I'm sure, uh, on the Security Council, there's too much vested interest, and France has been passed by Germany a long time over economically and so on. But France still hangs on to their place. Do you know that uh, one of the big battles was also nationalist China was made a, a permanent member of the Security Council. And later on, there was a great treachery by the US as they took it away from nationalist China and gave it to communist China. Communist China should never have been a permanent member, but now they've made communist China a permanent member instead of nationalist China, which is Taiwan. So the whole thing is rotten and corrupt from its inception. Wherever the UN goes, there is nothing but debauchery, there is rape, there is whatever filth you can find. Where the UN goes, it is the DRC. You won't hear it in South Africa. But the world uh, media and so on, they talk about it. Wherever the UN is, they are responsible for over half of the rapes in the DRC going on right now. They've yeah. been doing that in, in, in Bosnia, in the former yeah. Yugoslavia. Wherever they go. My friend. That, that is yeah. a communist uh, thing that is uh -huh. the new world order, the Illuminati, <coughs> the uh, 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 Freemasons, the whole lot. New world order. As you said, one uh, uh, government, one language, one currency, one world religion. That's it. So everything's together. All under Satan. <coughs> Bill Bathman, who lots of friends around Eastern Europe, he took me around Eastern Europe um, several times uh, into every part of Yugoslavia and Albania. And uh, the people that we met with there, what that say about the UN, do you know that a United Nations soldier is not answerable to the law of the country he's in or the law of the country he's come from? He's only answerable to the UN. And so as long as he does what the UN Secretary General wants, they'll protect him. And they protect war criminals. UN... It was documented in The Fearful Master how UN forces were using C-130s from the Americans, loading up the Congolese people's fridges and things from the Belgians had fled, loading them up into their, um, shipping them back home, back to Pakistan and Morocco and so on. They were looting the country and using the planes that American pilots were flying, their loot back home. It was blatant. It... it it's a criminal enterprise. So that's why um, uh, General Washington said, government is a fearful master, and it's a dangerous servant and a fearful master, but how much more dangerous a master is the UN? Because they're not answerable to anyone. If you've got a government that's answerable to the electorate that can be voted out and there's checks and balances, you know, like Switzerland and so on, then okay, dangerous servant, but fearful master. But who's over the UN, they are law unto themselves. It's absolutely disastrous, catastrophic. You cannot let these people into your country. They'll do what they want. And I must say, if the UN ever invaded our country, I'd feel absolutely nothing for them. In fact, that's why I bought my 308 uh, back in 1990, because the UN was threatening to invade our country. And I thought, well, see how many blue helmets I can get. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, th these people are, are absolutely merciless. They, f they feel nothing for the local population. So I think they are more dangerous than the Reds. You know, they come with their blue helmets. There was a time when, when my 
sons were wanting to buy firearms uh, and were going to the shops and trying to get some decent toys. And, you know, actually they've got this blue firearm and then you've got this action figure dressed in blue and he's called a peacekeeper. So they hell with peacekeeper. We don't want a peacekeeper. We want a soldier. You know, a real weapon. Who has a blue rifle? No. Like, so we hunted around to try and find someone. I thought there's no way on earth we want to carry around some, something associated with the UN. Ugh. I mean, I, I look at them as some of the most contemptible people on earth. Yes, rapists and murderers, criminals. As a, a school friend of mine from high school, he was with the UN down at the Golan Heights in Israel. When he came back after that half a year, he said, I tell you one thing, the money was good, but they paid. The duties was very good. All they did was drinking and going on the whole time. Peacekeeping, down there, peacekeeping. There is no peacekeeping. You will not get the Israeli and, and the Palestinian to have this. You will not, not ever, not what, after what I've yeah. seen. That's an 18 year old down there going for the money because it's all yeah. doing. Oh, it's a lot of money. Losing and so on. No peacekeeping. They did not use a weapon once. They claimed, claimed the weapon, but never used the weapon once. Nothing. Then they were flown back again. Peacekeeping, the UN. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's exceedingly bad. I mean, just like that chap who had been a British SAS, one of the best, Rhodesian Sea Squadron, you would have thought top class. How he could move from being a protector of people and a fighter of communism to wanting to direct Islamist jets and helicopter gunships to shoot down a missionary aircraft because they've got Bibles on it. That you'd even threaten somebody with that. In, incomprehensibly, what happens to them the, to transfer them? Now, I, I should say that on some of our missions, we've come across some individuals in the UN who've been on our side, but they've been low down. They've not been middle or upper echelon. And so we've actually, on occasion, not that we dare write about it, but we've on occasion been able to be given a lift in a helicopter, MI8 helicopter and so on, to take Bibles inside Angola, breaking the... The, the rules because the pilot was on our side we've had some UN people people from South Africa, police and army who've had duties in Sudan we gave them the Bibles and the books, they delivered them, they helped to smuggle, delivered to our people we, we were, we've had lower echelon UN people who've, who've at great risk to themselves I mean if they'd been caught they would have been in deep trouble but uh, there, there have been some individuals in the UN who've turned the other side there have been a couple of times when we came up to a UN patrol and uh, when I understood what you're doing, the chap concerned ordered his men to uh, go and check over there and then just let us go, and they shouldn't have. Uh, but the, the chap concerned must have been a Christian and had ethics and standards. So it's not that you can't have a decent person here and there in the UN, but they'll all be very, very low down. Nobody on the middle to upper echelons uh, over there would be anything but anti-Christian very hostile. The, there were missionary friends of ours who were forbidden to show the Jesus form in UN camps. I was closed down in UN camps, both in Kenya and in uh, Swaziland. Uh, going in, we're doing evangelistic work, and the UN people came literally threatening our lives to get out of there because we're not allowed. No, you can't show the Jesus form, but the people want it. They want Bibles, not allowed. There's a lot of hostility. Where do they, where do they get this from? How do they get such an anti-Christian hostility in the organization, considering they're coming from 122 countries. So you'd expect some Christians to slip in here and there. But somehow they managed to have an ethos there that's generally speaking anti-Christian. But anyway, we, we, so as not to endanger the people, we've never written about or put pictures about the times a UN person helped us, uh, because that wouldn't do their career any good. <laughs> but praise God, there, there are some people in there who turned a blind eye or helped us. Which Christian leaders um, spoke well of Kofi? The ACDP, uh, Cheryl and Dudley, sent out a press release uh, saluting this uh, leader. In fact, I, I got the press statement, uh, and it, it was actually shockingly um, positive. Uh, and that was the exact words I quote there. We salute a great Christian uh, a great African leader and diplomat. And, uh, even if I was a secular humanist pagan, 
I wouldn't call him great when he's had so many failures and so much chaos and so on. Even if I was on his side, I, I don't think I... So for a Christian to praise him, I don't know. I'm, I'm sad that there's such a lack of discernment. Well, Billy Mandela was held a hero. Yes, for sadly. Three months they were mourning for him. Yes. Oh, sad, sad. Yes. Um, what about, so what's the Rothschilds and that role there in the UN and that, or what's behind mm. the Illuminati and what's, what's oh. the whole move around that? These, these chaps are front and center, very important <coughs> uh, tools for the New World Order. <coughs> so the banksters, you can imagine how much benefit they, they get because the wars and these peacekeeping forces and the weapons and the vehicles and everything else, they've got to borrow the money from the banks. The banks are making a mint out of all this, all the destabilization and uh, uh, also their oil companies. Because, for example, just take the fact that you had in Libya a government that owed nobody anything and had their own bank and uh, they were exchanging oil for gold and they weren't using the banks and they weren't using dollars. So. To get rid of Gaddafi, got rid of an opponent of the international bankers, and uh, their oil reserves were able to be exploited by outside companies, no longer for the benefit of the people in Libya. <coughs> Same with Iraq. They also had their own bank, and so on. They weren't part of a Rothschild bank. Syria is also being targeted for the same reason. So, in many ways, the UN can be used as a private uh, mercenary force for the bankers, in order to destabilize an area that presents some kind of threat uh, to the, whether oil money or uh, banking money. The UN's basically a bunch of mercenaries, sadly, and not mercenaries in a good sense. Sometimes you can get a mercenary who fights for a cause. I know we had foreigners coming into Rhodesia who wanted to fight against communism. They got no special benefits. They got no different money than what a normal Rhodesian soldier got, which was next to nothing. Um, but they came there because they believed in a cause and they fought against communism. Now, that you, they might technically be a mercenary, but they were at least ethically, they were fighting for a principle and a standard. But then you get other mercenaries who could be, say, on the South African army side this year. But a few years later, they are with executive outcomes and they are helping the Angolan communist government against UNITA, who were our allies in the war. Now, that to me is unethical. Uh, I couldn't, in good conscience, go and fight against my old friends and allies of UNITA, the Freedom Fighters of Jonas Savimbi, uh, the Ovumbundu people. We know them. How, how on earth can, can we do that? So, now that's an unethical form of mercenaries. Then there's others who, they could be on any side. It, it doesn't matter. And sometimes it might be a criminal enterprise, sometimes it might be an ethical, sometimes it might be a government, other times not. Now, those are mercenaries in the worst sense. And I'm sorry to say that the UN forces are not doing anything ethical. I think that uh, a person who obviously was well-intentioned, like General Romeo Delier, he was shattered to the point that he wanted, and he attempted suicide because he felt beyond worthless as a human being when he realized what he'd been used for. So, yes, I'm not speaking against a person who might want to be a volunteer for another country for a cause that they believe in. But if you're just fighting for money and it doesn't matter which side you're on, well, that's a mercenary in a bad sense. Very bad sense. To be a mercenary for the bankers. <laughs> yeah. But have you considered this? That while the British Army did some good things in the 19th century, like fighting against slavery, the British Army was sometimes used as mercenaries for the bankers. The first time being in the Opium War, 1838 to 1840, when the Rothschilds smuggling opium into China were being stopped by the Chinese government. The Chinese government seized a whole lot and destroyed it, dumped it in the river. They got the British government to put their navy and army to go and fight the Chinese to make the Chinese accept opium, the drugging of their people. They were drug smugglers. So the British army was actually fighting to help the drug dealers open up the market of China to the opium. And then they were used at the end of the 19th century the British Army as mercenaries for the Rothschilds to come and burn down the farms and round up the women and children of the Boers into concentration camps because the Rothschilds wanted control of the transfer on the Free State, which was over the richest piece of real estate on earth, as they called it, where the Witwatersrand, the white water's rich, 
where you've got the most gold in the world. And so in Stephen Goodson's book on the genocide of the Boers, he's actually got the Christmas card that was sent to every British soldier in 1901 in South Africa. British, Canadian, Australian, all these mercenaries. Signed by the three top Rothschilds, Lord Nathan Rothschild and Leopold Rothschild, the three main Rothschilds, the only names on the card, three Rothschilds, the three top bankers in the world, thanking them, and they got a hamper with a whole lot of chocolates and pudding and cigarettes and tobacco and pipe, and there was a whole bunch of good things in there, soap and sweets and so on. Uh, they got a hamper each with a card from the Rothschilds, thanking them for what they were doing, which... You know, imagine if you're out there and you think you're fighting on the board and you suddenly get a card from Harry Oppenheim or something. Thank you. I didn't know I was fighting for you. <laughs> so also brought out in a Reformation Society meeting here by uh, Stephen Mitford Goodson was uh, after South African forces took Southwest Africa, German Southwest Africa in 1915. They marched past, remember that was back when people did a lot of marching, and they, they came through Kimberley and were given uh, freedom of the city and uh, the keys of the city and all this mm -hmm. symbolically. And the mayor, who was an Oppenheimer, thanked them. And in a speech that now, due to their efforts, under De Beers has come all the diamonds of the world. We control over 80% of the diamonds of the world because between German South West Africa and South Africa's diamonds, we now control more than 80-something percent of all the world's <coughs> diamonds. And they might have thought, wait a minute, I thought we were doing something to defend our country. We didn't know we were extending your diamond rights. Today, the worst crime you can commit in South Africa or in Namibia is illicit diamond buying, IDB. And the IDB is one of the most serious police divisions out there. And any diamond in Southwest Africa or Namibia or South Africa, even if it's on your farm and you found it or you were snorkeling at the bottom of the Orange River and you found it in the Orange River. It belongs to De Beers, even if you found it on your land. And for you to sell it, you'll get more time in jail than for murder, even more than for tax evasion. Uh, this, is, this is vastly worse than any other crime you can think of. Illegal diamond buying, which just goes to show, as Stephen Goodson says, who actually runs this country? The biggest crime you can commit in this country is to take a diamond, not going through a De Beers controlled source. So just think about that. These people on the ground, these Malemas and so on, who are they working for? They're not free agents either. They've got to go to London and get the instructions from Lord Renwick and so on, just like all the others. So interesting. Uh, I never would like the idea that I'd ended up being a mercenary for some banksters. <laughs> but uh, it would seem there's a lot of people, and you may even know some people who in a UN operation. It's, it's good money, as you say, but uh, I'd say it's soul destroying. <coughs> this is my book. You might want to have a look at it, General Romeo Delier. Absolutely staggering, a staggering indictment. Just the last few pages. Could we have stopped the genocide? Yes. Could we have done more to save lives? Of course. So, I mean, it's, this is one of the most damning indictments on the UN ever. And um, written by one of their own. A liberal, secular humanist, pro-UN person who actually believed the propaganda. And his life was shattered as a result. And he says he's, he's never recovered and he never will. And, he doesn't think there's a day that can go by that he can't get by with less than nine tablets and all that heavy medication. Um, but his pictures and his documentation, it's, this is what I would like uh, people to read rather than uh, foolish praises of Coffee and None. How many lives has Coffee and None ruined? You know, it's, it's bad enough that the UN came and disarmed the people around her. It's bad enough that they stood by and did nothing when the people were slaughtered. But how could they take people from the camps that had gone to the UN for protection and hand them over? How could they then decide to drive out in the middle of a genocide, leaving all the people who were depending on them for their lives at the mercy of these mass murderers? 
How can you live with yourself? Kofi Annan, I think, must be one of the most evil people on the planet. Well, he's no longer on the planet right now, but he was. Um, and so I, I think it's sad that any Christian would go to praise someone of the New World Order. And plainly, I think the world, the pagan, anti-Christian world, would be praising him. He served them. But for a Christian... Quoting, it's a point that a man wants to down off that the judgment would be more appropriate. So, uh, lecture notes are here, also on the, uh, the Gay Mafia, the latest Christian Action newsletter. Let's pray, let's um, bring these matters before the Lord and pray for the people still in the Congo suffering under the UN and in many other places where UN operations are on, like Central African Republic.